so a topic. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and let's get started with our, our next presentation. Um, I don't know about you, but real world Kubernetes security is something near and dear to my heart. So please give a warm Schmookon welcome to Mark. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay right now? I think you can. Okay. So uh, the title of this talk is uh, Command and Kube Cuddle because I refuse to call it Kube Control and make this pun work of my own presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking about Kubernetes from a pen testers perspective or a red teamers perspective. People that work in security and can kind of harden Kubernetes environments um, however you see them. We're going to do this through three different case studies and these are amalgamations of projects that I've worked on or things that we've seen in the industry that are common misconfigurations, um, common attack vectors, and we're going to go through an entire kind of attack chain of uh, finding uh, an issue, finding something we can exploit, going through the Kubernetes cluster and seeing if we can exploit it. Uh, you know, I, I hope I did the right sacrifices to the demo gods, etc. Um, the the thing that I want to do is though, as we exploit these through the different attack chains, I want to talk about the different technologies and the components and why they fell over or what misconfigurations uh, happened there. So my name is Mark Manning. I go by Antitree on Twitter. Um, I'm the technical director at NCC Group, and I have a bunch of researchers that work with me on just containers and Linux kernel stuff and orchestration stuff. And we do a lot of different container assessments, which is a vague uh, thing now because there's so many things that bake in containers now. We see them in firewalls, in cars, and like whatever you want to uh, have run a container in, uh, you're probably going to have like some definition of a container if it's just like namespacing. So we do a lot of assessments there. I'm from uh, Rochester, New York. Anybody from Rochester? Yeah. yeah. This is, I was just saying something last night. This is the only conference that like more than one person from Rochester is going to like pipe in. Um, uh, I run a 2600 group in Rochester. We've got a B-Sides in Rochester. Uh, this B-Sides for B-Sides Rochester is our 10th anniversary. We've been running it a really long time. It's in March. CFP is open right now, and uh, it, it's a cheap, fun uh, event for anybody to, to, to come to. So in the beginning, we had containers. And I really got into containers because I was coming from the world of Android and mobile platforms, and I really liked OSs that had um, application isolation. If your Android OS has, uh, you know, apps that aren't allowed to influence other apps. And I was like, okay, cool. Here's this new container technology that's going to start getting worked into the desktop and the server environments. And it's not really how it worked out. But um, in an ideal scenario, a container might be a few processes in an isolated environment that is designed to perform one single task, like a microservice. And in reality, containers end up being more of a security opportunity, if you will. We can lock down containers, but no one's going to call a container a sandbox alone. Um, Jesse Frizzell has done a ton of work um, a long time ago uh, building things like SecComp BPF profiles for Docker and locking down. And actually, it was successful preventing a bunch of um, uh, ODAs in the Docker service itself. And then what do we do? Sometimes we like disable all of that work that they've done. So. Um, my, my example for this is like, well, you know, how much do we trust containers? And would you run a piece of malware in like a hypervisor in a virtual machine? Some of us might. Uh, I have never seen anybody that says like, I'm going to run a malware in this container because I trust the container uh, security model. And then came Kubernetes, which made it even worse, actually. Um, so Kubernetes was this thing that we kind of said was it was really all related to containers. We said in the, in the first place. Um, containers were this cool technology that's going to allow us to scale up and scale down. It's going to have all these different enterprise features. But really, Docker doesn't do much of that uh, itself, and the container engines don't do much of that. All of the work is done at the orchestration uh, level, right? So Kubernetes being the orchestrator that won the, the orchestration wars that lasted for like two months. Um, but they provide authentication controls, authorization controls. Um, things like storage management and networking becomes complicated when you've got multiple servers and multiple containers that need to connect into each other. They do this through like just running clusters, right? Like if you imagined what you needed to build 
uh, if you wanted to run a bunch of containers across different servers, you'd go, well, okay, I need to run these containers on this server and probably need to have like an API that phones home and says like, hey, here's the status of this container and it communicates to other containers and stuff like that. And that's, that's really what Kubernetes does. It's this glue of a bunch of different APIs and plugins that you can use that just manages containers uh, at scale. And, and this was the big thing that started turning, um, I think, uh, containers into a more production-ready uh, uh, travesties. <laughs> so we said, you know, in the beginning, Nginx uh, could be running in a, in a container. It's, it's running as maybe UID zero. We had this isolation and we had this kind of security boundary and then one of the first things that Kubernetes does is they say, we should um, split this out into uh, pods. So we dropped the idea of a security boundary in just a single container. Now we have pods that kind of share some of the namespaces with other containers. Uh, so you might be running uh, like Nginx container next to an Envoy container. And there's also this init container that starts up kind of in the background that, that you don't know about. Um, so we're starting to just blur the lines of what the security boundary is and what the security expectations for these uh, environments are. And if you're coming from like a network pen test uh, background and you like, you know, understand vulnerability assessments and you understand IPs and Nmap and Metasploit and whatever, and you might think of the uh, Kubernetes topology like this where we've got this control plane that does a bunch of administrative stuff and we've got a bunch of workers and they're called nodes that are at IP addresses and you might have just stumbled across this. Um, like once a month at least, I get one of my coworkers messaging me saying like, hey, I've taken over a pod, what do I do now? Um, and it's because they're not even on like a Kubernetes assessment, they're just on some kind of internal network assessment. They roll into a VPC that's got Kubernetes there uh, and they accidentally exploit it. But we can't think of it as, um, uh, as a network service per se. We can't think of it as 10.10.3 is this pod that runs Nginx and I've just exploited Nginx because they're ephemeral. They should be running for minutes, they should be running for uh, maybe a couple days at, at most usually. So I like to think about it more like this diagram that I've created, which is like an OS uh, stack, right? Like if this was like a, a Linux OS stack, you'd have a kernel down at the bottom and Kubernetes has the, uh, the kernel of the cluster operating system, if you will, which is the Kubernetes API. Everything goes into this API. Authentication contro controls go, thr go through here. Extra plugins all, will all communicate over this API. This ends up being the thing that we really want to target. And then we have nodes which are just servers or bare metal or EC2 instances, however you've deployed like kind of your workers inside the cluster. Pods we already mentioned can run a bunch of different containers. And we have this idea of namespacing, which we'll talk more about later. A namespace is mostly like a, like a logical separation of Kubernetes objects. If you've got like a bunch of these types of workers, you can throw them in a namespace. And then we also have um, services that we use sidecars. When we said like a pod is multiple containers, you probably have like a primary function of that uh, pod, which is maybe Nginx. And then you might have something like Istio that runs what's called a sidecar. And it has a separate function to help support the primary function of that container. And what's the name of the bar at this uh, hotel? <laughs> Seemed like perfectly kismet. So everybody should have a drink at Sidecar after this. Um, but why are we doing this talk? I think there's a lot of challenges for pen testing Kubernetes environments. I think that um, we as an industry, we as InfoSec people, we as hackers, um, don't have a, all the tools and don't have all the knowledge, I think, as an industry um, to easily do this. One of the reasons is the, the uh, threat model is always up for interpretation. And this is true for any customer you work with, a business, you say, well, okay, you've got a different threat model than this business over here. Um, but we haven't seen it at a platform level like this before, I don't think, where you'd go in and, and imagine seeing like, okay, here's Ubuntu, it's running PHP or something like that. You kind of have an understanding of the, of the threat models uh, uh, that it provides or, or the security controls it provides. But then you have Kubernetes which can be configured in so many different ways and so many different security expectations and extra controls bolted on top of it that you can't really make any assumptions and you need to do uh, a lot of work to just understand what they're trying to do in the first place. The other part of this is that there's tons of misconfigurations that are really subtle. This isn't a, a thing where you go and you point and click and you know, compares against the sys Kubernetes benchmarks with which we wrote. Uh, nothing against them, it's just that this, the benchmarks themselves uh, don't always fit uh, in together with themselves. You can't just check all of the secure buttons on Kubernetes and, and things uh, uh, are secure. Uh, 
Kubernetes comes out with new releases every three months, which is insane of an idea for like a lot of production environments. And even more crazy is that uh, every, they only support three previous versions, right? So only nine months of support for every cluster is, is possible. And besides that, besides the support, it's not as big of a deal as the APIs that get deprecated really quickly. So from our perspective, we're writing tools, we've got all these like hacker uh, stuff that we, uh, that we like to run, and then APIs get deprecated, they don't work anymore, we need to update these tools, we need to update uh, our knowledge and our expertise uh, constantly. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a, a long struggle. And I mean, the point of all this is I'm obviously biased, I work for a company that, that sells services that humans like do reviews of, but I think that humans are still the best at um, doing security assessments of very complex systems like this. So as we talk about um, the things that we're going to go, uh, the, the different nuances of Kubernetes and the, and the misconfigurations of Kubernetes, I've created um, three completely random uh, uh, businesses. And we'll talk through their threat models and we'll talk through um, how each one of them uh, is able to respond or defend from the same attack, which is they're running a service on port 5000, the service uh, is exploitable, and an attacker can take over a pod. So the first one I want to talk through is uh, Power Maverick. And uh, again, you can see they're running a service on port 5000, is exposed to something called Web Admin. And Power Maverick, if you can imagine, is like a company that sells power analytics on-prem for their customers. So they're basically selling Kubernetes as a service to deploy into your own private cloud, into your own uh, bare metal systems, into your data center. And imagine they're doing like some number crunching on just how much data or how much power you consume. So their expectations are, one, everything has to work. They've got a product team that says, make this thing work. I don't care what you need to do. And two, they've got... Um, uh, they've got to make sure that they don't affect um, the rest of their customers' environments. They can't introduce new vulnerabilities that, when this thing is compromised, uh, affects the rest of, uh, of their infrastructure. So they do this with a couple of different security controls. They um, leverage the latest Kubernetes defaults. And if you take nothing else away, uh, take away that you should never do that. Uh, Kubernetes knows that uh, their defaults are insecure. You know, their, their design is not to make uh, Kubernetes secure, it's, it's to make it functional. So they're using Kubernetes defaults. Um, they're using everything deployed into the default namespace, and we'll talk about some of the implications of that later. Um, and then the cluster is deployed into a dedicated VPC, and this is one of the smartest things they could do, where they say to their customers, look, take this Kubernetes cluster, but I want you to deploy it into this isolated environment so that even if it gets uh, compromised, uh, it kind of mitigates the, the attack from affecting the rest of the infrastructure. But the real rub here is that they're using something called Helm 2. How many people here have heard of Helm? Okay, right. Oh, nice. Um, so I'm not going to go too, in, too far into it because it's kind of beating a dead horse at this point, but Helm 2, uh, and there's a new version, Helm 3, used a service called Tiller, and this service was notorious for being um, easily deployed into a cluster and it allows you to push down different what they call charts and it'll just run like an application. Imagine like a, like a Play Store for Kubernetes. You can just say, here's this chart I want to run. It's, it, it runs Nginx for me. Cool. It did this by setting up a service that sits inside the cluster that you would communicate to and say, hey, here's what my pod looks like. Go deploy it for me. The problem being there was no authentication and no authorization controls built into the service by default. That's, that's how they told you to set it up. Um, the other problem is that there's no isolation from the web admin pod that we've compromised to this service. And literally copying and pasting this command that I have here, helm2, give it the host, which is always the same host name in the cluster, point it to say install, and here's a chart that, uh, that I've created that is malicious that will dump all the secrets of the cluster back to my house. Uh, it will compromise the entire cluster. Now that's not really uh, cool to talk about because I, I really want to, the point of this is like the results of this. Um, attackers are able to compromise the pod, they can steal all the data and analytics for the customer. There's no PII, uh, there's not a lot of sensitive information, there's not like tokens or, or stuff about the company. They've, they've owned this specific uh, uh, you know, application that, that's run by Power Maverick, and they should obviously fix it. But when we're factoring in mitigations and, and impact here, it's, it's important to understand the, the uh, overall risk. And you go back to the business and say, look, I've, I've owned your entire cluster. 
here's how I did it, and they say, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna keep this design and we're just gonna patch the original remote code execution in that application that allowed you to get in. They're not gonna change the cluster. Um, and, and I don't agree with it, but it's a valid decision because it's low cost to maintain. Uh, they have their own business that they need to factor in, but the, the point being is that here's one specific threat model, here's a business that chose this threat model for this Kubernetes environment, uh, and we need to, to kind of deal with that. Second company is more interesting. Second company is uh, Cyber Shmoo, and they are a business that has only one customer, and that customer is ShmooCon. And Cyber Shmoo handles all of the tickets for ShmooCon. Um, so they are a multi-cloud architecture that load balances uh, between Google Cloud and between like Azure. So they've got different Kubernetes clusters in different clouds, and their expectations are basically they need to sell tickets three or four times a year for like, you know, 0.3 seconds. Um, <laughs> so it just needs to have that super high load for a short period of time and, and it needs to work. Um, the other one is that it's a super high value target for hackers, right? We're at a hacker con, uh, we're selling hacker tickets and hackers are going to hack into my system to get hacker tickets. So we've got skilled hackers that are able to, you know, invest time to get these tickets and and I don't know how much they're worth on eBay. Hopefully, anybody buy tickets on, on eBay? Or, no, they don't want to admit that, okay. The, other, the third part of this that for security expectations are um, they, don't want, they want to limit the risk of an insider attack. They want to limit like, being able to uh, you know, knock dark Darth Null on the top of the head and be able to steal tickets and, and passwords for accounts. The way they do this is um, Direct access to the cluster through kubectl we'll go into uh, in a little while, but just understand that like you, you don't have administrators that are able to log into the cluster itself. Everything is abstracted away using Terraform, something like Spinnaker, so that you need to have access to the Terraform scripts that are deploying this stuff. So most of the time you'll see more like a CI CD flow for the infrastructure that just gets deployed into, the infra into, uh, into Kubernetes or modifies Kubernetes. The other part of this is something called node pools we'll get into later, but node pools is something that Kubernetes is investing a lot of resources in, uh, in being an isolation barrier so that even when we compromise that web admin service we mentioned before, um, it shouldn't allow you to compromise the rest of the cluster. And the third one, and uh, uh, we're seeing a lot more of our customers doing this, they're leveraging hypervisor-based container engines, uh, things like Gvisor, Firecracker, when they need to have like a workload that is super sensitive, they'll still put it into a hypervisor because we know how that works. The results of this are one, it's like a high barrier uh, for attack. So mission accomplished, it's really difficult to break into this cluster. Even when you can break into the cluster, the node pool will isolate it so it's not compromising the entire cluster. Even in that case, we've got multi-cloud architecture with a load balancer, we can flip over to the other cloud environment uh, when we need to. The problem being is like, yeah, this is great, and I, and I like this model, and I really like the, the scenario where we're abstracting away direct access to the Kubernetes clusters, and we're seeing more customers doing this. Uh, it's super uh, expensive to maintain. Infrastructure costs, SREs that know how to deploy this stuff, we can't really expect that everybody has the, the uh, resources to be able to deploy clusters like this. But we're kind of talking about like a Goldilocks scenario, right? One's too cold, one's kind of too hot, I don't have the resources to, to build that. This next case study, we're going to go into more of a demo. Uh, this is eCloud. It felt like something from Silicon Valley. I don't even know if it exists. Um, eCloud is a geographically diverse startup. They've got companies, or they've got like developer groups maybe in uh, Singapore and in Canada. And each developer group is able to deploy their own code uh, into the Kubernetes cluster. So the, the organization has an IT operations that sets up the cluster in the first place and then they grant access to the developers to be able to deploy their own code. Developers push their own code, developers also make their own security choices for the applications that get deployed. The way that they do this is they isolate with a namespace, and this is the first example of Kubernetes trying to do multi-tenancy stuff in our case studies. So they're trying to say like uh, one development group represents one tenant, another development group represents a different tenant, and all this is restricted with roles, and all of this is restricted with pod security policies we'll get into uh, in a second. So let's see just how successful any of this stuff is. So I wanna walk through an attack chain, hopefully we can demo this stuff if the networking is working. Um, and, and go from finding a service to exploit, going through the cluster and, and seeing where we can take it from there. 
So to start off, we've got a service to exploit, which uh, is an ode to one of the first uh, pen tests I ever performed, which, which allowed just a, a, a URL parameter to, to execute commands into the cluster. Super nice. Uh, we can dump ENV. We can you know, do whatever commands that we want uh, in there. So cool. My first demo was successful. That, that was pretty stupid. Um, <laughs> This is what it looks like, though. If we, if we walk through this slowly, port 5000, we, we go into the web admin service, we've compromised the pod. We, we can do whatever we want uh, in the pod. What do we do? This is still the most common question I get from coworkers that are like, I've compromised a pod. What do we do from here? So the, the first thing we need to understand is the idea of service tokens. And these are jots that are just stored in the same path every single time. var run secrets kubernetes io slash service account slash token. And that JOT is able to authenticate to the Kubernetes API. Remember I said the Kubernetes API is the like, kernel of the cluster operating system. Why would anybody put an authentication token in every single pod that gets deployed to allow you to access the, you know, uh, the Kubernetes API? One reason is um, they think that pods need to understand uh, how they're running in the context of the cluster, so they need to go ask the, the cluster some questions. Uh, a more common one is there's a service like um, if anybody uses HashiCorp Vault, there's a secret injector for, uh, for, uh, for HashiCorp and for, for Kubernetes that uses an authentication token to authenticate back to the HashiCorp Vault service. So that's kind of like service to service communication. That makes sense. But the most common thing we still get is, you know, it's there because it's the default. It's there because changing it might break something. And that's not because, you know, that's not to make fun of somebody that, that makes that choice. That's because Kubernetes is so complex, you're really scared of changing whatever defaults that they've set up. So if we go back to this, and, and now we kind of have a, a, a targeted approach of what we want to uh, look at, we can look at the, uh, the, the token. If we just cat var on secrets Kubernetes IO, uh, and I'm going to paste that over here really quick. And we can look at some other stuff too. Uh, let's find the Kubernetes endpoint that happens to be in an environment variable. So 10.27.240.1 uh, is just exposed. And if I did a command like this, if you can kind of break it down, I'm, I'm hitting the uh, Kubernetes API. I'm just catting the token into the API. And I'm saying, like, tell me what endpoints you have. And this is interesting to us because we have the public endpoint uh, uh, of the Kubernetes API. I don't know if you can see that stuff in the back, but I just pasted in the public uh, API. This gets us something like this. kubectl get pods, scare pod. Okay, cool. So far it's working. We now have access into a part of the cluster. We don't have access to everything in the cluster. Let's just see as an example. I tried to query the, for running pods in the default namespace. It doesn't work. I query the secure namespace. It does work. So let's walk through this a little bit more. Um, I curled the uh, endpoints that are exposed in the Kubernetes API. I got back the endpoints that were, uh, that were uh, publicly accessible. I'm now just connecting in from my laptop through that uh, IP address into the, uh, the Kubernetes API, and I'm using that service token. So the tool I just used was kubectl. Um, kubectl can do whatever you want in the Kubernetes API. It's the command line tool for, for all of that stuff. It doesn't imply that you have access. This is just a tool that allows you to do certain things if you do have access. So there's two angles of this. You can start saying like, look, I've taken over the pod. I can do whatever I want in the pod. I'm going to curl bash you know, all my favorite binaries. I'm going to curl bash kubectl into the pod, and I'm going to configure it to start interacting with the API. Or if the, um, the cluster is exposed publicly, and by default for a lot of providers, this is always true. Um, you can just connect to it remotely from your machine, and that's, that's how we're doing this now. We have access to a token. What do we do? The service account doesn't mean we have full cluster admin. It doesn't mean we can do everything we want, and hopefully the service account you have uh, is constrained. And if it's not, we can see what we can do from there. Um, the other part that I'm skipping over here is the things that you can do inside of the container. One of the first steps that I'll say to my coworkers is, okay, you've taken over pod, run a tool like Kanmachi, which is a, a tool that we wrote in Go that dumps all the available syscalls that your container supports. It dumps all the mount uh, information and gives you some perspective on uh, potential insecurities. So maybe there's just a built-in breakout to the uh, pod itself. But I really want to know what I can do in the context of the cluster. So we already noticed that we can't do everything. We can, we can kind of uh, access some areas. Um, but if I ran uh, kubectl auth can I, nice little API command. Oops, I should spell things right. 
can't see this because I've got it so big. Basically, this is showing that uh, you can't do much. You can access the health Z API, you can access open API version information. If I do the same command to the secure namespace, it's going to give me a uh, different result. I'm trying to make this as big as possible. But on the very top, it shows verb star dot star, uh, basically uh, permission to do anything that you want. You can also look at it in this way. <coughs> There's a tool called Access Matrix, and this tool will just give you nice pretty check boxes for all the different things that you can do. The most important one to us is this pods uh, uh, API, which we're going to leverage. So this is list, create, update, delete. I can list a pod, I can get information about the pod, I can create a pod. Um, so let's see what we can do uh, from there. All of this, uh, all of these controls are set by a role and a role binding. And our role, as we've just found out, looks like this, star, 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 star. We can do anything that we want within the context of the secure namespace. So again, like we're looking at a development environment, the, you know, the group in Singapore has access to their, their own namespace and they've decided to create a service token that can do whatever it wants within the context of that namespace. But theoretically, this, uh, the, whatever they're doing in Singapore shouldn't affect whatever they're doing in Canada. Um, RBAC and, and RBAC auditing is its own subject, so there's a link to a blog post if you're interested in uh, some of the other tools that, that we would use to, to further audit that. But now we're on to the phase of like attack pods. What do we do now that we know that we can deploy into the Kubernetes cluster? What can we do? Uh, what kind of images and, and, and things can, should we deploy? So if you make your own attack images, you could put your favorite tools, any customized terminal commands, uh, all your pre-compiled binaries, all that kind of fun stuff into your favorite image. And that's what I did with this tool uh, that I call Brick, is, is public if anybody wants to download it. Brick is a, a blunt object with literally every tool that I could think of just thrown into the image. It's not uh, you know, this amazing uh, thing, but anybody can go out and build this. Uh, let's see if we can't deploy uh, Brick into this environment. So first I want to just try if I can run a pod. So kubectl run, let's say like a busy box uh, image. So we have full control over the secure namespace. Dash N means uh, the, the, the namespace is secure. Image is busy box and named in my shell. This seems like it checks out. And I've created a demo that is designed to fail, uh, as not many people would say. Uh, this, is, this is blocked out, and, and why is that? Because of a pod security policy. And this is something we're seeing more and more of. A pod security policy is a policy that goes on top of your cluster admin roles or whatever permissions you have access to and it further restricts what you can do in the environment. So we have full access to that namespace. We can do whatever we want, but there's a PSP on top that says you can't run uh, these certain conditions uh, or you can't do certain things. So in our environment, we see there's two namespaces so far, secure and default. So secure has a PSP, uh, default does not. And as we bypass this, I want to uh, kind of point out how this works. When we uh, want to uh, create a pod or deploy a pod, we make a request that goes to the Kubernetes API and says, hey, here's the pod that I want to create. Here's what it looks like. It's a YAML file. And the Kubernetes API says, okay, cool, I see that you've been uh, authorized to perform this task. It then sends it to uh, what's called an admission controller, and in this case, the PSP admission controller, which reaches out and looks for a policy inside the cluster that says, hey, this person that's allowed to do stuff in the cluster wants to make a pod that looks like this. And the PSP says uh, yes or no, depending on how secure or insecure that, uh, that pod is. So our PSP looks like this. It's got two main things. One, it says privilege false, which means that you can't just run a privileged container that would just bypass all the security controls. And two, it says uh, must not run as root, meaning you can't run uh, a container as the UID zero or anything with those capabilities. The problem being that PSPs monitor at, uh, at the initial point in time, like when you create the pod, it only checks it at that time. It doesn't go back and monitor it. So there's nothing preventing something to say, well, my pod has changed, it's been updated, uh, there, there's no controls there. And, and I'll show you like how that's gonna work with a command you may have heard of called sudo. Um, but why do we even need uh, a root in, in the first place? Um, a lot of services, like in, in I think in 1.15, they changed the permissions on that, uh, that service account token that I said was in that same path. So now you need to be a privileged user to access the account token. Um, some things, TCP dump, for example, you might need to be the root user. But most likely, uh, when you're managing uh, storage and you're using file system permissions in your storage stuff and you mount it inside of a container, 
um, being the root person just uh, automatically you know, evades any kind of permission checks that are there. So how do we get around this? We mentioned there's the uh, brick pod. And I'm going to deploy it into, oops. Deploy it into the secure namespace. And all this is saying is kubectl run. I named it my special pod. And I'm telling it to use an image from a third party host. And that's going to be a big takeaway later. This is a public um, host that's an image registry. And I'm saying, please deploy this image that I've, that I've created myself. Uh, let's see if it's uh, done creating it. So it, it is really a brick. It's like 400 megs it just downloaded. So it's now running uh, in the service. And I can run something like. Uh, port forward to my special shell on um, port 8080. And this creates a loopback uh, connection into that, uh, that service that I just created. So this is all still um, through the Kubernetes API. Um, you know, who am I? I'm, I'm nobody. Oh, wait a second. Now who am I? Ooh, I'm root. Um, a stupid demo. So here's some processes that are running. Uh, looks pretty legit. This is the normal processes you, you'd see in a pod. I'm running something called Gotti. Anybody use Gotti? I really, really like it. It's a Go TTY, like a web TTY. I use it a lot of the time. But let's get into uh, the next phase of this and look at, um, let's do something like this. Uh, let's try that. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Let's just review what we've got so far. So we've evaded the PSP. We have now deployed our own image into the secure namespace. We now have full access to that pod to do whatever we want in that pod. This is kind of a review. We've, we've gone from finding a service to exploiting it, taking the service account token, bypassing the PSP. Now we're at the point of talking about namespaces. We keep mentioning it, but let's, let's understand namespaces a little bit more. Um, we have two namespaces, default and secure. And we have role bindings and PSPs and different secrets that only apply to uh, one single namespace, right? Like you normally can't uh, uh, have secrets that are scoped to the entire cluster. You normally would have them say like, here's this namespace secrets, here's uh, these other namespace secrets. These are just a logical separation. This is the, the huge takeaway. This is not a security boundary. This is a logical grouping more like a folder. Um, there is no network controls on any of this stuff. So as I'm doing a port scan in the background right now, there's nothing preventing one pod from accessing another pod. The, a, a namespace alone cannot provide that stuff. We can do things like Istio and Envoy that attempt to do that, but by default, uh, none of that is possible. So we just ran that net scan. Oh, we found this cool service on, on this IP address. Let's go back and see if we can't uh, access that. Uh, anybody heard of SoCat? Again, all these, all these modern tools like sudo and SoCat you've never heard of. Um, I just created a SoCat pod with a little bit of extra configurations there. Uh, we'll, we'll walk through that in a second. Let's just port forward to it. Um, secure namespace, and what did I call it? SoCat 249.99. So this is another service in a different namespace and hey, it looks like that other service that we exploited earlier, which is super convenient for my demo, right? Um, but let's just, let's just walk through. I'm, I'm, I'm going through a SoCat image that I just deployed into the secure namespace. I'm telling it to forward into the uh, other uh, pod and other namespace that's in a different location. Those are scoped differently, and they have different uh, security controls on them. So is this a privilege escalation? That's what we want to try to figure out. So the, the SOCATing thing is like kind of like a server-side request forgery, right, like uh, at scale. We can connect into our, from our laptops and connect into other pods and other services. Um, so again, we have the perspective of we can tool up um, the images that we can now deploy and try to attack it just from command line inside of a terminal. Or if we can forward back out to our laptops that has all of our favorite tools, uh, why not attack it there? And this is the, the command that I ran, uh, basically just running SOCAT and giving it a SOCAT configuration. This is a good opportunity to mention crew. Anybody heard crew? Do we know crew? Oh, man, OK. D forget everything else and just remember this one right here. Um, crew is uh, like pip for kubectl. So kubectl is the, the binary tool that can interface with 
uh, with the Kubernetes API. Crew is a whole bunch of tools. I think they're up to like 40 or 50 different tools that allow you to automate some of the common steps that I just did. So that long SOCAT string that I just did in a couple of the demos, I say, you know, run, run SOCAT, here's his configuration, here's his IP address, and then, oh, create a port forwarder. Um, I wrote a tool for crew called NetForward that allows you to uh, give it arbitrary IPs and arbitrary ports into the, into the, uh, the cluster. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but if you're interested in that tool, it's open source and, and inside crew right now. So it's literally like you do kubectl crew, install this plugin, it automatically pulls stuff down. And the value for pen testers and people that are working on, on auditing a Kubernetes cluster is it's not deploying anything into the cluster. You're not affecting production if you're working in production. Um, you're just running tools on your own laptop that help speed up the process of exploitation. So let's see uh, where we're at. We've got a new token. Let's copy this out. Uh, let's modify our other token. I don't know if you can still see in the back. All I'm doing is uh, token swapping my kubectl uh, config file. If when I say get pods, um, this is a different environment, and let me show you why. If I go back and I say show me the secure namespace, it says you can't anymore. So I've hopped from one namespace to another namespace, and I now have different permissions in that namespace. Um, so let's see what we can actually do. Uh, cat my special uh, pod that I've created. Just really quickly, the important parts here is I've, uh, I'm running a privileged pod, and I've got something called a host mount. And I want to do a kubectl apply this uh, special pod and bypass some stuff there. Pod's been created. Port forward again to that pod that I just created. It's called brick something. Yep. Okay, so there's some processes running. Let's just turn into root for fun. Basically the same amount of processes. Let's do something slightly different in this one. Uh, chroot command. So time machine going back to, to the 90s when we used chroot environments. Uh, I have a lot of different processes that are running now. And if I run uh, Docker PS, uh, there's a lot of different containers that are running inside of my pod. No, that doesn't make any sense. Um, what I've done is I've chrooted the, um, uh, the host machine into my container. So I've taken like the slash directory of the Linux box underneath it, and I said, hey, mount it in this directory. I just happened to name chroot. And then chroot into it, which basically is rebooting the entire uh, box underneath it, the node underneath it, into my container. So I'm still in a container, but from a security context, I've taken over uh, that entire box. So I now have full control over the underlying node. Uh, let's see where we can go uh, from here. Uh, inside that node, there's a uh, convenient, uh, the kubectl command, uh, the tool has already been uh, downloaded for me. And if I export uh, a specific path, Um, I can interface with the cluster again from inside of the node. We're getting kind of like recursively confusing. Um, so now, uh, if I do something like all namespaces, we see something that we haven't seen before. This is all of the pods that are running inside of the cluster, which doesn't really render correctly, but um, this is Kube system. This is the secure namespace. This would be all of the, all of the developers' environments uh, that, that, you can, uh, that you can imagine. So we now have the ability to do whatever we want in the cluster, see anything that we want in the cluster, but because we're using this kubelet config file, uh, we're restricted. So let me just show, if I just wanted to do like a run, images, uh, busy box, I don't know if that's right, but here's an example of a failure. No, I just did it wrong. Anyways, you can't run that uh, because the kubelet config is specifically restricted. So if I did access the uh, this path, Etsy Kubernetes manifest, um, nodes have special permissions inside the cluster. They're not allowed to uh, just do anything that they want. So even though it looks like uh, I have access to do 
uh, anything in the cluster, I'm still slightly restricted. So if I did that command, did it run? Uh, terrible rendering. Uh, what you can see is three to five seconds ago, a new container was just created. I do the same thing of kubectl, get pods, all namespaces. Uh, we'll see that there's a lot of interesting uh, new pods that just got deployed, one of them being uh, this one right here. So what I did was I created a YAML file, I pasted it into the, uh, the, uh, this known path, and the way that nodes work is they will mirror that path, whatever YAML file that you put it in there, and deploy it into the cluster. And what's interesting is that it deploys it into the kube system namespace, and we didn't have access to that before. So let's see uh, what's over there. Kube uh, system namespace. The name of the pod is this, so I'll put the YAML. And here's this interesting IP address for uh, the service we just deployed. And we go back over to here. And we use that tool that I just mentioned. We give it the IP that we were just looking for and uh, the port we wanted to connect into. And we've created a listener on it, uh, on port 999, I think. And we now have, uh, Um, if I just do this, okay. Um, you may not understand what uh, commands I just ran, so let me walk through that uh, really quick. What um, I just created a mirror pod. I just created. Uh, an, I just compromised an entire node. I was restricted so that I could only execute things on one single node. All of that happened. Uh, and, and when I uh, deploy the mirror pod into the cube system, I create a remote uh, connection into it, and that compromised all of the nodes in the cluster, and the, uh, the entire cluster is completely owned. The end. Thank you. I, I think you're applauding just for Kubernetes for it to like work in a consistent way twice. So. <laughs> um, so the issues that we went through, uh, in a summary, you know, there's an overprivileged role bound to that secure namespace. That's what we leveraged in the first place. That web admin pod that we popped um, granted us the ability to do things in the cluster we shouldn't. We see that a lot of the time. You might say, like, well, you just made up this environment. We still see a lot of uh, environments that have full uh, uh, permissions to do these things from the service token level. PSPs, we're seeing PSPs deployed everywhere now. Fantastic, not everywhere. We want to see it more. Um, but we're now seeing a lot of scenarios where PSPs can be bypassed and, uh, uh, and, and they're done in subtle ways. A big thing that n not everybody agrees with me on is that your Kubernetes cluster shouldn't have access to Docker Hub and it shouldn't have access to GCIO by default. We should be running private uh, image registries because one of the ways that uh, I was able to pivot through this stuff is by making a custom image, hosting it uh, you know, externally, and then just pointing to it to download. So we should all consider Docker Hub as just like a malware repo. Um, <laughs> The other part of this is that there's no uh, network segmentation between any of the namespaces. We might say like, oh, namespaces, I understand this in Linux, but in Kubernetes, it doesn't actually have any security context whatsoever. It's just kind of groupings and routings uh, that are isolated. Uh, we can reinforce namespaces. You can create uh, multi-tenant uh, namespace clusters with networking isolation, but you need to install something like Calico or Istio, uh, and then they have their own, kind of, uh, their own kind of issues. But we're seeing a lot of customers doing the multi-tenant uh, types of deployments just like this, um, but uh, it falling over one way or another. The other big thing was the reason I was able to take over a node was because uh, there's the entire cluster allowed uh, privileged pods to be deployed. And this is still the default and we still see it every single time. We're starting to see a couple of PSPs now that will restrict it, uh, but there's like if you go to install Kubernetes today, they'll say nobody should ever install privileged containers. And then the Kubernetes directions on how to install Kubernetes is like install these four containers that are all, uh, all privileged. So we're, we're at this weird scenario. So in summary, um, you know, we've got these three companies. One is, you know, didn't invest a lot of money and resources into securing it, kind of still works. CyberSchmoo 
threw a ton of money at it, uh, uh, and, and it was relatively successful. eCloud had the multi-tenant environment, which is really complicated and complex to actually deliver. We see this environment more often than not where uh, different developers are allowed to deploy into the cluster, and when we as like infrastructure people just go, well, you know, it's the developer's fault if they skew something up. Um, and that's true, but the whole point of this is, uh, you know, where is the security boundary? I originally got into containers because I was like, this is a really cool isolation model, and it's just like leveraging Linux uh, uh, primitives, but is it at the pod level? Is it at the namespace level? Is it at the node level? Um, it all depends on how you, uh, how you deploy it. It all depends on, on uh, uh, how you decide to implement all of these controls. So hopefully Kubernetes has all the security abilities that, uh, that you need for your threat model in your organization, but it's just not always true. Um, they're not building for security yet. They're, they're working hard to make things more secure and to bolt on security features, um, but it's a, it's a cat and mouse game where new features are coming out very, very quickly. We saw namespace isolation is difficult. We saw that privileged pods still exist. We saw that, uh, you know, RBAC is really tough um, to get right, and even when you have it right, it gets applied in really super vague ways. Um, go back to that blog post that I was, uh, I was mentioning earlier to, to see what that's talking about. Um, and notice that somebody was, was asking before, like a journalist was saying, like, you know, are you dropping any, any O-days on Kubernetes? I'm like, no, we're not at that phase. We're, we're at the phase of, like, there's still so many misconfigurations that these are the ways that we break into Kubernetes today. Hackers are breaking into uh, to Kubernetes by just looking at the common misconfigurations or accidentally things that are exposed. So I'd love to come back in a year or two and say, wow, Kubernetes is, is super secure. Now we've got these new O-days. Uh, we dropped uh, two or three CVEs this year, and you know it got patched and it, it got fixed and stuff like that. But I think this is the better conversation to have as an industry uh, is talking about misconfigurations and how we can fix them uh, from either the infosec side or from the container side. Uh, just to finish up, a couple of things I want to call my shots into uh, further research, and, and hopefully, you know, if you're interested in the stuff, areas that you can look at too. Um, service mesh is a uh, technology that's being deployed everywhere. Istio is super common. Uh, look what happens to your uh, Istio deployments if your pod or your container runs as UID 1337. Uh, it's a fun little, little thing that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more in a blog post later. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, Ian Coldwater and Brad's uh, uh, KubeCon talk that's hopefully going to go into more uh, attacking Kubernetes from, like an, uh, from an exfiltration and evasion standpoint. Because uh, we've got Twistlock and Aqua, we've got Sysdig, and things that are attempting to find us already, like just detecting TTYs. So how can we evade them, and, and how can we start playing that cat and mouse game? And I haven't gone into really practical compromising of saying, like, you know, here's a store that's running, or here's an Nginx instance that's doing something specific. How do we break into it? How do we spoof it? How do we mirror it? How do we really compromise, uh, uh, you know, real-world scenarios like that? So I, I think, I mean, we know how to do it. I, I just, we don't have enough time to talk, uh, talk through it right now. I think we'll see more uh, talks like that. And then finally, um, we do a ton of work with eBPF. Anybody experts or, no, I won't say experts. Anybody work on eBPF at all right now? So this is a, a topic that I think, again, in the security industry, we could really leverage into an attack tool. And that's something that we've been building. We've, we've done a couple talks at, at DEF CON and at CCC about eBPF. eBPF is currently used as a defense tool for monitoring the kernel in a very performant way. But there's nothing to stop us from doing all these nasty things in, in, uh, in attackers' ways. So, um, Two new tools to release. One, uh, Go Pillage Registries. This is a tool that if you understand uh, how a registry works, uh, and if you understand how Shodan works, uh, this tool uh, will go through and automatically look through an image registry, look through the metadata of that image, and, uh, and extract secrets from it automatically at, at scale. NetForward, we already mentioned before, and there's links to more information about it. Kanmachi is a tool that we wrote um, that, that dumps information about the containers once you've exploited them. RBAC tools, uh, this is just a link to a blog post that goes into some of the existing RBAC tools and, and how we audit them. Um, so before I finish, I want to thank a couple people. Jack Leadford is, is somebody in the company that gave me a lot of feedback on this, and Rory McCune uh, is another person uh, in the industry that, uh, that is, is really pushing, the, I think, the security boundaries. And all of these people uh, I hope to meet one day uh, and thank them, but they're on Twitter, and these are the, the people that we should be helping uh, support then and helping uh, secure Kubernetes.
So that's my time. Thank you very much.